Welcome to Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Today's episode will pick up part two of our conversation with chair of the AMA Board of Trustees, Dr. Willie Underwood. He's joined by a panel of AMA attorneys to discuss the key advocacy issues at the state level. Panelists include Michaela Sternstein, Vice President of the AMA Advocacy Resource Center, or ARC. Also, Senior Attorneys Daniel Blaney-Cohen, Emily Carroll, and Kimberly Horvath. If you missed part one of this series, I encourage you to go back and give it a listen. And be sure to subscribe to Moving Medicine on your favorite podcast platform. Here's Dr. Underwood. Let's talk about a few of the victories in each of these areas that we've had over the past years and how significant they are, you know, and have you found these wins shifting, you know, conversations in the state? We're going to go with Emily first, then Daniel, then Kim. Thanks, Dr. Underwood. Um, we, there have been a significant number of victories in the states over the last year, and I just feel so lucky to get to work with um the leaders at the state medical associations and in the national medical specialty societies who um, are key to obviously getting these these bills across the finish line in the states. Um, and as Kai mentioned, these are like these are you know, and as you mentioned as well, this is many years of laying the groundwork for prior authorization reform. It's not it's usually not like a state introduces a bill one year and it's passed a couple of weeks later. Um, it's a lot a lot of work by the medical associations in the states to to um, educate legislators on the problem, to bring patient groups together, to um, address the issue, you know, as a coalition. Um, so it, it's just many years and enormous amount of time to get these bills across the finish line. Last year, we saw three um, major bills passed and several others that are were more targeted. But um, after many years, uh, our colleagues in the District of Columbia were able to pass a fabulous reform bill um, that, that incorporated a lot of the components of our model bill and principles um, and worked with a great coalition of patient groups and other uh, physician and provider groups in that state. New Jersey, same thing. Many, many years of work by the Medical Society resulted in a bill being enacted last year. Um, and Tennessee as well. Tennessee uh, did a great job getting their bill across. But then there were many other that I'm not mentioning that were hard fought and um, and fantastic uh, victories last year as well. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to see that kind of same momentum happening this year. Um, Mississippi, I know, just passed a bill, a prior authorization bill, um, just a couple of days ago, and we have more coming. So um, I think I think as as these bills pass, um, you know, other states look at the, those successes and build off of this. I think the most commonly asked resource um, that I'm asked for is our state uh, state law chart. So that you know, one state who's working on prior authorization is able to see what their neighbors, uh, you know, recently passed, or what what how they approached uh, a certain problem related to prior authorization. And so every time a state is able to enact something, know that you're you're helping another state move their um, prior authorization progress forward. Thank you, Emily. Kim. All right. Um, thanks, Dr. Underwood. So there is an amazing amount of work um, at the state level by state medical associations and national specialty societies. We can't say that enough on all of these issues. And I'll just let you know, we had a number of tremendous victories last year on scope of practice. Um, together, working again, close collaboration with the state's medical associations, there were over 100 victories on scope of practice. Um, but that was also because there were a significant number of bills. So we also saw more bills than any um, other year. Um, but in terms of some states that had, I will say, significant when South Dakota defeated a physician assistant scope bill for the third year in a row and by wider margins than previous years. California defeated an optometry surgery bill um, last year. They defeated it again this year. Um, the APRN compact, which is something that we we saw introduced in a number of states, that was defeated in every single state last year. Mississippi, um, a scope bill did not even make it out of committee that year, last year, and they had a number of them. Texas defeated every single scope bill um, in their legislature. They had over 100, over 100 just in Texas last year. Texas is not in session this year, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but each of these victories 
Um, and I'm and I'm again to Emily's point, I'm not mentioning all of them. Like this is just a handful. Um, but each of these victories should not be taken for granted. The state medical associations and the national specialty societies put in so much effort to achieve all of these victories, to make them happen. It's a years long process. Again, educating lawmakers on the difference in the education and training of non-physicians compared to physicians, what the patient safety implications are for these scope bills, um, what the cost differences are, how, how, these sco how expanding scope of practice has been shown to actually increase the cost of care, def uh, refuting those myths that we hear from non-physicians about them going into rural areas. If you would expand their scope of practice, they'll practice in rural areas. We know that's not the case by our resources like our GMAPs. We can show that is not the case. Um, and the fight does get harder year after year. I mean, you know, states are incredibly relentless and they will work on these, but it does get harder. And for the most part, and, and you kind of alluded to this before, non-physicians go in and fight these bills year in and year out. They have one issue, one issue. This is it. Physicians, groups, AMA, the state medical associations, they have a number of issues that they are working on fighting on behalf of patients. Prior off, physician wellness, we're talking about those today, but also the overdose epidemic, telehealth, AI, reproductive health, the list goes on. Um, but you know, right, that's what leaders do. So we will continue to lead on all of these issues, including making sure that lawmakers know the importance of physician-led care. And each of the states where we do have victories, other states learn from those states that were successful, um, whether it's sharing um, communications material that they created, um, repurposing some of our tools to brand for their state medical associations, all of it coming together, um, sharing resources and making sure that everybody has um, the best information that they can, again, to, to again, support physician-led care. Curated from more than 3,000 major newspapers, magazines, and journals, the AMA Morning Rounds newsletter delivers the top stories in healthcare right to your inbox Monday through Friday. Subscribe today and check out all the AMA's free newsletters at ama-assn.org slash myinbox. That's ama-assn.org slash myinbox. Daniel. Yeah, and one of the things that, that, that Kim and Emily are both sort of bringing up is, you know, that all of these affect individual physicians. I'm going to highlight individual physicians again, you know, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one, I think it's important to be really clear that every victory that we have on, on these issues um, directly affects individual physicians. Um, you know, with respect to physician wellness, um, you know, some of the, some of the, the significant wins, um, you know, at the federal level, the AMA has supported and is continuing to support uh, the Dr. Lorna Breen uh, Healthcare Professionals Protection Act. Um, it's going to have a particular focus in the next round, um, you know, appropriations on reducing administrative burdens. Um, so we've, we've identified that. Um, on the legislative front, um, we've really followed the leadership in, in, uh, from the Medical Society of Virginia. Um, and they were one of the first states to enact laws to protect the confidentiality of individuals seeking care in a wellness program. And that law, what we've done from the AMA, is take that law and encourage other states to adopt something that works for those states. And we're somewhere between five and 10 additional states have, have built on what Virginia has done, and we're continuing to build on that. Um, on the regulatory front, you know, again, with, with medical boards, you know, I'll give you one example. Uh, Kai is very generous, uh, but our, our, our partners at the Medical Association of Georgia made introductions to us to the, uh, the, com the composite medical board of Georgia. And we had discussions with their executive director. And in the course of literally a few weeks, um, the Medical Board of Georgia changed its questions based on those discussions. And it wasn't because of anything magical we said, we brought awareness to the issue. Um, and they hadn't looked at it in a long time and they got it, they understood it. They, they took that leadership uh, challenge to make that immediate change. That's what physicians do on a daily basis, right? You don't, you don't, you don't tell your patients, well, wait a couple of months and then do the course of treatment that I'm recommending for you today. Um, so that that doesn't that doesn't happen. You know, some of the things that people might not have heard about 
um, a lot of times in the, the beginning of our campaign, a couple of years ago, we kept on hearing things like, well, the Joint Commission requires us to ask these inappropriate questions. And we thought that was strange. Um, and, and it took us a couple of weeks, but we, we called the Joint Commission. We found the right person to talk to. And, and we said, hey, we, we heard that the Joint Commission requires, requires hospitals and medical boards to ask these inappropriate stigmatizing questions. And the Joint Commission, you know, uh, virtually scratched their head and, um, and they said, no, we, we don't do that. And then the Joint Commission took a, you know, a big leadership state, uh, step and issued a, a, a public statement saying they supported the AMA, the FSMB um, and others that they don't require those questions. So we break down these myths and we keep doing that every time we hear it. Um, and, you know, so you know, what is it, one of the other places that an individual physician um, can be a leader? Um, every physician on this call or that you talk to your, your friends and colleagues, uh, you can send the AMA your credentialing applications. Let us analyze it to see if they have inappropriate questions. And then we will be happy to work with your hospital and health system or your state medical board to revise those questions. We're happy to reach out. Um, I don't mind if people tell me no. Um, I don't mind it to providing that direct analysis. My colleagues, you know, and I, who I work with here, uh, we do that on a day, literally on a daily basis. So, you know, the most significant uh, people are getting it. There's a lot more people that need to get it. Um, and that wasn't the case, you know, six months ago, let alone a few years ago. So we're, we're, gonna, we're one at a time, Dr. Underwood, we're taking care of this one at a time. Awesome, awesome. I tell you what, the three of you were speaking, you know, I was listening intensively and however, and through my mind, I was hearing a theme song of Rocky. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and, 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 you, and, and we have to be congratulated for that. Our teammates, you know, across the country who are in the states coming together to fight these things that stand up need to be applauded for that. But at the same time, I need you to turn to your colleagues who are complaining about what's not being done and say to them, put up, stand up, shut up. We prefer you to put up and stand up because without them, right, we can't continue to win. And with them, we can solve most of these problems. We can create the collaborations we need. We would have the resources to be successful in these battles. Having said that, talking about resources, right? <clears throat> what are some of the resources that you have to offer to those working in these state advocacy issues. And I'm gonna go with Daniel, Emily, and Kim. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Underwood. I think the resources that, that I have, and I'll be pretty brief here, um, I have a lot of examples of states that have done the work. So we have great model state uh, legislate, legislation. Um, so other state legislators, you don't have to guess about what works. We, we can, we can, you know, I, my, my greatest skill as a lawyer is copying and pasting. Um, so I can give you that information that, that other states have already enacted. And again, they've enacted unanimously in red, blue, and purple states. On the, uh, the regulatory front, any medical board that is interested in what language that more than 20, I think it's, uh, we're up to almost 30 states now that have adopted language consistent with the AMA recommendations and the recommendations of the FSMB. If you're wondering what those recommendations are, let us know and we will provide you that exact language that your colleagues in other states are using, national best practices. The same for hospitals and health systems. Uh, one of the most important credentialing uh, advisors is the National Association of Medical Staff Services. Uh, it's a really arcane, you know, sort of a really unique name, but everyone in the hospital and health system credentialing world knows who NAMS is. And NAMS recommends language consistent with the AMA recommendations. So the resources that we have use the resources that other leading institutions, legislatures, and medical boards already are using. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, Dr. Underwood. There are great examples, and we can get you that direct language that your colleagues are implementing as national best practices. All right. Thank you. Emily. All right. Well, I will just be quick as well. Um, we have, in terms of state legislation on prior authorization, we have a model bill that is constantly sort of evolving our council on legislation, we, which discuss additions or subtractions from the bill probably once a year um, based on best practices we're seeing in the states in terms of legislation. 
Uh, but we offer that and it serves as a basis for a lot of the reform proposals we see every year. We also have, as I mentioned, have our state law chart where you can see what other states are doing. Um, again, copy and paste is a great thing and um, kind of look and, and see where other states have had success and where you might have that in your state as well. We offer issue briefs, um, constant bill analysis. Uh, always feel free to reach out to me with, uh, to get thoughts on a bill. Um, we have draft testimony. Um, we regularly write letters in support of legislation in the states, if helpful. Um, but I would argue probably my, my greatest resource is uh, Heather McComas and our Administrative Simplification Initiatives Department. They put, they're the awesome team that puts together that um, prior authorization survey every year. So looking at the impact of prior authorization on patients and physicians, and more recently employers, which I think is an important uh, group that we need to ha start having those prior authorization conversations with. Um, they also, we work really closely with that team putting, you know, collecting data um, and other uh, research um, about the negative impact of prior authorization. Um, and we just generally work really closely with that department to make sure states have all the resources they need to keep having these important prior authorization conversations. Jim. Thanks, Dr. Underwood. So as Kai mentioned at the outset, we have an expansive library of tools and resources on scope of practice that we provide to the state medical associations and national specialty societies. We've got model legislation on physician-led team-based care, on truth and advertising that I already mentioned earlier. We have a series of issue briefs that um, provide a short and sweet overview of some of the key, key topic areas, including studies um, and some data. We've got a legislator handout series. Um, we have a number of state laws charts comparing scope of practice laws on physician assistants, nurse practitioners, naturopaths, pharmacists, you name it. We've, we've got it. Um, we, of course, have our GeoMap series, which is over 4,500 static maps now, um, 50 states um, across three points in time now, comparing the practice locations of physicians to various non-physicians in each and every state. Um, we have our health workforce mapper, which is um, available to anyone on the AMA website, and that is a, 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 a map, mapping tool as well that the geomaps are actually built off of this similar platform um, that can show you not just the practice locations, but a number of other uh, population health indicators and others as well. We've got patient surveys. We've got um, uh, handouts for patients, giving them some information on, on how they can find out who is providing their care, just some simple questions that they can ask. Um, we, of course, have our um, data series modules, which dives really deep into the difference in education and training. And that is the backbone of a lot of our resources, like our legislator handout series. Um, and um, our issue briefs. Um, and and we, we use that information in all of our letters to lawmakers when we talk, talk to them about um, the different um, scope bills that they might be um, considering, making sure, again, that they know what the difference is and why it matters um, when we're talking about providing care to patients. Um, and this is just, you know, we also review uh, model, we also review bills um, for state medical associations to point out some of the concerns that we have um, and what um, how it might look compared to other states as well. And then, of course, we draft letters. Um, we have physicians who testify in state legislature, legislatures um, often on a scope of practice. Um, Dr. Ferguson has testified a number of times this year already, and, I, and you have in the past as well, Dr. Underwood, so thank you for that. And, and we'll continue um, to use these resources and, and make sure that they're available um, to our colleagues at the state level. Yes, yes. All right. <clears throat> so Kai, so how does the ARC team work with the states and specialties around the country? So if I'm a physician and I want to see your material to advance legislation or regulation, how do I go about that? How do Hi. I make that a reality? Great question. Great question. So first of all, um, we're available and we're probably, I would say, one of the most responsive units uh, in the AMA. And you'll get information about how to contact us directly here at the AMA. I strongly encourage you to be an AMA member, though, before you connect. But we will never turn anyone down. Hopefully, your interaction with us, if you're not a member, will cause you to become a member once you've met us and uh, experience uh, the 
the amazing work that that this team does and frankly all of advocacy we are part of a broader advocacy business unit that is just lights out um also another way through your medical association because if you come to us for a model bill for example we will always let our medical association colleagues know um we need the uh, collaborative um, setup that exists within the Federation of Medicine to get model bills kind of across the finish line. So we don't um, want really to have physicians going off on their own without the benefit of the knowledge and expertise of our, our knowledge and expertise, but also that of the state medical associations and the specialty societies as well. So boots on the ground are the state medical associations. They, they live in the state capitals. They know what's going on. Oftentimes we read about things and, and the process is already light years ahead of what's listed in the New York Times, for example, or whatever. So we have to rely on one another. We are stronger together in this. So whether it's through the state medical associations or your specialty societies or directly to us, um, our materials are available. We are available to talk to you about issues uh, as they come up and how to best strategize on how to accomplish a win for medicine at the state level. All right. All right. So. You know, patient safety often comes up as as, as we discuss this, and, and it's interesting. You know, when I look at uh, scope of practice, I think you know when we talk about physician led teams, we haven't for some people we haven't defined who's playing what position. Right? No team would allow a center to say, you know, I decided I'm gonna be the quarterback today, right? Or the guard to say, hey, by the way, I'm gonna be the receiver today. Because it doesn't make sense. You don't win games that way, right? So when people, and those of you who don't know, I'm talking about football. So people who, we're talking about patient safety and patient care delivery. When people say, hey, although I haven't received the training to be a surgeon, an eye surgeon, right? I'm an, I'm an optometrist, but I haven't received the optimistic training of an eye surgeon, opt, you know, ophthalmologist, then, but I want to do what they do. That's like the center saying, I want to be the quarterback today. So, so Christopher Kim, so how do we make patient safety key when we're addressing these inappropriate scope expansions? It's a, it's a great question. Thank you for that, Dr. Underwood. I would say that patient safety is paramount when we are talking about inappropriate scope expansions. It's really the center of our conversation on these issues. And to build off with what you were saying about optometrists, we make sure that legislators know that optometrists have not attended medical school. And when they go into these states, they're putting language in these bills that would allow them to perform surgery after completing a weekend course in a hotel ballroom probably performing simulated surgery. And they want legislators to believe that that is adequate to be able to allow them to turn around and perform surgery on patients. They are trained, they're, they're great members of the healthcare team, but they're trained in primary eye care, not in surgical techniques. And um, we need to make sure that lawmakers know that. Um, we also use patient safety in our discussions on nurse practitioners. We know in physician assistants, we know, for example, that nurse practitioners practicing outside of physician-led care use more resources, um, which increases the cost of care. And yet there are studies that show that they actually achieve worse outcomes than physicians. And it confirms what we have been saying that removing physicians from the care team is associated with lower quality care. Um, and that same study also shows that nurse practitioners actually cost more to employ because of all the extra studies that they um, that they uh, in test that they um, want to run on patients. So um, in the end, physician-led care is the most important, um, is, is the answer. And certainly the patient safety aspect is really key in, in, our, in our work in this space. Awesome, awesome. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. 
To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. Let me just really quickly, Kim, you touched upon this briefly, but um, there's a question about the lack of regulation of, of nurse practitioner education, or I should say lack thereof. Do you want to uh, touch on that a little bit and how we um, let um, legislators know? And also the question around kind of frustration, like legislators are exhausted. They're bombarded by scope issues. How do we get past like sound bait type of messaging that they're so willing to accept just to kind of solve the problem and move on? Yeah, no, really good question. So on the soundbite thing, I think that the we, what we always do is we go back to data and we make sure that lawmakers have data at hand and provide them with the citations behind that, right? And why um, it is important and why it matters for, for patient care. Um, on the nurse practitioner and, and what we see in terms of their training, uh, we see it, we know. And, and again, we try to make sure that lawmakers know there is a lack of standardization in nurse practitioner education and training. Um, right, they 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 only complete two years of graduate level education and 500 to 750 hours of clinical training. But of that, 60% of nurse practitioner programs are partially or completely online, and nurse practitioners often have to often have to find have to find their own preceptor. So there is no standardization in the clinical training piece, and what that means is there are, when you look when you go back and then look at that, is that not all nurse practitioners are trained the same way. And studies done by nurse practitioner organizations actually show and confirm that there is wide variation in terms of clinical experiences in basic things like prescribing medications, performing comprehensive physical examinations, really basic, basic elements that, that every nurse practitioner should be able to do. We're finding that there are some nurse practitioners that may only perform that one or two times during their entirety of their training. That is a problem. Um, and so again, we point this out to lawmakers and make sure that they understand this, but definitely a problem. So I wanna thank you for our amazing panelists. I wanna thank all of you for this great discussion and to all of you for listening and for, for thinking about what we're talking about and hopefully utilizing the information that we have in the future if you haven't already done so. Our AMA Advocacy Research Center on our website is the place to find the resources, the data points, the model legislation, the white paper, and a host of other materials to support you in our advocacy efforts at home. Notice I said our, not your advocacy efforts because we are in this together. So we're asking that you take advantage of of our amazing resources and you work with us and we allow you to work and allow us to work with you because teamwork makes the dream work. Thank you very much. This has been Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Subscribe today to never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.